What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition Power Gamers Tactics Room. I'm your host, Bill Brian Bafflestone, and today we are having another episode of my review and rating series, this time looking at the races post Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Because Tasha's had a seismic impact on character creation mechanics in 5th Edition, such that you can swap out your stat bumps and you can swap out your proficiencies. So previous to Tasha's, pretty much the first thing that a power gamer would do would be to start filtering out races based on their stat distribution so that the stats fit the build that he was trying to put together. That eliminated a lot of races right off the bat to, before they could even be considered. But post Tasha's, that's not a consideration at all. You can get any stat bumps that you want. So this greatly magnifies the power of racial abilities, and it opens up a lot of intriguing synergies for the power gamer in terms of trying to find an advantage. So we really need to take a fresh look at races in this post-Tasha's environment uh, and try to see what we can leverage. So let's take a look. We're going to be doing this in three parts. First, I'm just going to throw up all of the races grouped by how I have them ranked so that you can get a quick holistic understanding of how I have them distributed. Then I'm going to go into each and every race and go over their abilities and give you my thoughts and rankings. Then I am going to present to you a much more granular chart that maps out specific class and race synergies for those of you who uh, are really data-driven. So we can see my rankings on the screen. My superior races are Aarakocra, Mountain Dwarf, Goblin, Satire, Winged Tiefling, and Yuan Ti. My good races are Custom Race and Variant Human, Dwarfs Variants Hill, Durgar and Mark of Warding, Gnome variants Zverf Neblin and Mark of Scribing, Halfling variants Mark of Healing, Mark of Hospitality, and Stout, Kobolds, Simic Hybrids, and Warforged. My average races are Asimar variant Protectors, Bugbears, Elves, Githyanki, Gnome variants Forest and Rock, Half Elves, Halfling variants Ghostwise, Lightfoot, and Lotus Den, Hobgoblins, Humans variants Marks of Passage and Sentinel, Lokatha, Loxodon, Minotaur, Shifter versions Beast Hide, Swift Stride, and Wild Hunt, Tabaxi, Tieflings that are not winged, Tortles, and Vidalcan. My poor races are Asimar variants Fallen and Scourge, Centaur, Changeling, Dragonborn, Genasi Variant Fire, Githzeri, Goliaths, Half-Orcs, Humans Variants Mark of Finding, Mark of Handling, and Mark of Making, Kalashtar, Leonin, Lizard Folk, Orcs, Shifter Variant Longtooth, and Tritons, and the inferior races are Furbolgs, Genasi Variants Air, Earth, and Water, Standard Humans, and Kenku. So that's a brief look. Let's take a more granular look. I'm going to be doing these mostly in alphabetical order. However, I will be starting with the Custom Race and the Variant Human. These are pretty similar, and these, I think, kind of set the standard. I have them both rated as good, and they both start with a feat of choice. Now, Subpar stat bumps are sneaky bad. They only get a plus two, whereas the standard is a plus two plus one. So that is a whole half a feet below par. The feet choice has to be really good for it to make up for this. Uh, and the custom race I find problematic in that it adds only two to one stat. You can only raise your points to 15 in point buy. So that means you can't get two stats at 16. Uh, that's kind of an issue for me. The upside is that if you choose a half feat, 
you can get 18 in a starting stat. And so that is near, pretty much as good. Uh, so I consider these basically the same, just a little bit different based on how you want to set up your character. And the starting feat in isolation is excellent. It sets a high bar for racial abilities. Now, I do think starting feat is only the fourth strongest of the racial abilities, so there are some better. But some, build, be, some builds do depend on a feat uh, at tier one, specifically looking at pole arm master and uh, crossbow expert. Now, keep in mind, the subpar stats are a lot large opportunity cost, and feats are available through play, while racial abilities are not. So I would personally consider feats for certain builds instead of racial abilities, but honestly not too often. One final note, check with your DM to see if the custom race is eligible for the appropriate racial feats. That's not spelled out, and I can see you know, different DMs having different opinions on that. So the first race then, after custom and variant human that we're going to be looking at, is Aarakocra. And these are fantastic because of the Flight 50. That's just elite. I mean, really nice speed and the maneuverability is just fantastic. Please see my video on maneuverability to get a, you know, a, some insight as to how strong I think that sort of thing is. I consider flight to be the third strongest of the racial abilities. The starting feat was fourth. Uh, this is an excellent option for casters and ranged attackers. I would personally consider this on any non-melee build. Next up, we have the Asimar. They are okay. Resistance to necrotic can be nice. That comes up fairly frequently. A cantrip, a little bit of healing. The transformation is what makes this character, and that is for one minute, one time a day. Very limited uses. The fly of the protector is really attractive, so that's cool. The extra damage of the aura is solid once you start to climb up in levels, but Damaging yourself is just weird. It's, that's annoying. It's going to create concentration issues. I'm not generally impressed with the Asimar if we're looking at the course of the entire adventuring day. They can be pretty good in one battle. Next we have Bugbears. I'm impressed by that five foot reach. That gets them all the way up into average. Otherwise, they're not that great. Next we have Centaurs. They have a really fast base speed of 40. That is pretty cool right out of the gate, but the rest of their stuff doesn't really hold up. I have to give them a rating of poor. Note that they do have some flavor in that a PC can act as a mount. I guess that's kind of intriguing if you have a cavalier or mounted combatant feat. And while the melee buffs are unimpressive, they can stack nicely with feats, specifically looking at mobile here to get your base speed up to 50. That's pretty, pretty nice. Next we have changelings. I rate these guys poor. Their one special ability is basically like an always on disguise self, so like an invocation or a, a magic item without attunement. Uh, that's okay in the interaction phase of the game. In fact, it's really good in the interaction phase of the game. Uh, in combat, they're not going to be helping much, so I just give them a rating of poor. Dragonborn are not that great either. A lot of flavor uh, roleplay wise. But the breath weapon isn't great. It consumes an action for unimpressive damage. And the damage resistance can be solid if it's fire or poison, but it doesn't really save this race for me. Next we have dwarves. Dwarves are pretty intriguing. They add a bunch of really cool abilities like that advantage on saves versus poison and poison resistance. And you can get some really nice abilities out of the Mountain Dwarf. They get a plus one stat buff relative to par, and medium armor proficiency is very intriguing for uh, casters who often want armor and will dip for it, but if you are a Mountain Dwarf, you might not need to dip. It also opens up heavy armor proficiency, uh, which I believe you can then add shields. Uh, the Durgar do suffer from sunlight sensitivity, so keep that in mind. You can get a Fighting Initiate feat if you have a Martial Weapon proficiency through this class and you don't need to uh, get it through uh, a dip or anything. You can take Dwarven Fortitude. That is going to combo really well with a Bloodwell file if you're a Sorcerer. Uh, I would personally consider Mountain Dwarf for a Sorcerer build. 
and then just hope my DM plays ball and throws me a blood well vial. Very solid race overall. I give Mountain Dwarfs a rating of superior and the others a rating of good. Next we have Elves. And I have never been as impressed with Elves as others. I do get that they have access to Elven accuracy. I do get that they have that martial weapon proficiency. Uh, that I get that the wizard cantrip is nice for marshals who want to pick up Booming Blade. I just look at all of these things and I am just not super impressed. I mean, the Shadarkai and the Eladrin seem to be the best versions with that bonus action teleport. It's only one time per short rest. I just give them a rating of average. Next we have Furbolgs. These are straight inferior. They have unimpressive abilities with limited uses. I don't see why anyone would want to play one. Next up, we have Genasi. So again, I'm not all that impressed with these abilities. Fire is the best, and it sneaks into the poor tier, but the others are just inferior, unimpressive abilities with limited uses. Next up, we have Gith, and these guys are very popular. They add armor proficiency and weapon proficiencies for the uh, Gith Yankee, and they have psionics. So very flavorful class, and uh, a lot of history to them, but when I look at their stat block, I have to give Gith Yankees an average and Gith Zeri a poor. The abilities aren't that impressive and they have limited uses, and medium armor proficiency and martial weapon proficiency are good in certain builds, but without anything else, I, I'm not that impressed. Next up we have Gnomes, and Gnomes have Gnome Cunning, which is one of the best racial abilities in the game. I have it ranked as fourth, tied with Starting Feet. Granting that advantage on intelligence, wisdom, and charisma saves versus magic is just fantastic. So many crippling wisdom saves in Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, rolling it at advantage just never gets old. The extra abilities aren't that impressive, but Gnome, Con Gnome Cunning is the star of the show here. It is elite. The Spur of Neblin in particular, I think, are excellent in an Underdark, underdark campaign. And I would personally consider it for an Underdark campaign. And in fact, I made Bill Braun Bafflestone a Spurf Neblin. Just really love the Gnome Cunning. And I have a Stealth Suite, so being able to do that in Rocky Terrain is great in the Underdark. And 120 foot Dark Vision, when most people have only 60, is really nice. That opens up a lot of kiting opportunities. Next up, we have the Goblin. The Goblin comes with a bonus action hide or disengage every round. That is amazing. I can't overemphasize how impressed I am with this ability. It basically confers cunning action to the goblin without having to take any thief levels. Wow. I mean, Fury of the Small is also sneaky good, but that bonus action hide and disengage just really, really impresses me. This is my favorite race, I would rank them number one in terms of power, and my uh, I'm going to be using this in a lot of builds going forward, and man, I would change Bill Run Bafflestone to a goblin in a second if I had a chance. Pardon me wants to try and get a wish to do it, but I can't find any kind of role-playing justification for wanting to do that, so I'll just do that on my next character. Next up we have the Goliath. I'm not all that impressed with the Goliath. The cold resistance is decent. And Stones and Doors does have certain synergies, such as protecting your Armor of Agathus damage bump and for retaining concentration if you're a caster. Overall, uh, yeah, I don't see why those classes would really be attracted to Goliath, so I give it a rating of 4. Next up, we have Half-Elves, another one that people tend to love and I'm not so impressed with. It, they do get an extra stat bump, and that's nice. And I do find that the Mark of the Storm variant is pretty good. Not quite enough to bump it up into the good category, but I think the best of the half-elf variants. The Free Wizard Cantrip is nice for very marshals to get Booming Blade. The martial weapon proficiencies are nice, but nice is average. Every race has nice stuff, generally speaking. So just average for half-elves. Next we have the Half-Orc, and I'm not too impressed with them. The, the Quasi Death Ward does appeal to me. That is really nice, but otherwise I'm just not that impressed. I guess if you're a crit fishing build, you might like doing a little extra damage. But overall, 
rating of poor for the half orc. Halflings, they are interesting with that lucky ability. Rerolling ones is a pretty interesting ability, especially if you stack it with like lucky and chronal shift. Uh, note some people say it's good with portent. I don't see it. Portent has to be applied before the roll, so I don't know why lucky would really matter. And specifically, the mark of healing option is elite for halfling spellcasters who don't normally get healing spells. That is a very cool uh, ability, and that's why uh, Mark of Healing and Hospitality Halflings and Stout Halflings get good ratings, and the others get average. Next up, we have Hobgoblins, and these guys get some love. I only rate them average. I do admit that Saving Face is sneaky good. It is limited use, however. And I do get that Light Armor enables Medium Armor Proficiency, and the Martial Weapon Proficiency enables Fighting Initiate. So I can see it being good in certain builds. I just overall am not as impressed as some people, so I only give it a rating of average. Next we have humans in the standard and then various mark forms. And the standard human is just bad. I mean, lots of stat bumps and then nothing else. Nobody ever wants that. Then the various mark ones are okay. I think mark of passage and mark of sentinel are the standouts here. I really like their expanded spell list and being able to do, you know, shield or misty step once a day is always fun. And the others are just kind of poor. I'm not really all that impressed with them. Next we have the Kalashtar. And I gotta say I love their flavor. I love this idea of a telepathic race that has a suite of, you know, mind abilities. I'm just a little underwhelmed here compared to the alternatives, so I've got to give them a rating of four. Very nice flavor, but the abilities are, are really niche. Next we have the Kenku. I consider them the worst race. I mean, these abilities are just horrible, and they don't do anything well. So uh, get out of here. Next we have the Kobold, and the Kobold is surprisingly good. They have pack tactics so they can get advantage on attacks when an ally is within five feet of the target. Plus they have that other thing where they can grant allies attacks to advantage versus enemies within 10 feet per round. But the standout here is pack tactics. That is surprisingly strong and has good synergy with things like the Battlesmith Artificer or Summoners. Pretty impressed with the Kobold, even with the sunlight sensitivity. Next we have the Leonin. And I'm not impressed with the Leonin. I do like the bump in their base speed, but otherwise their abilities just aren't that great. Give them a rating of poor. Next we have the Lizard Folk, and they also get a rating of poor. They have a bunch of abilities and none of them are really any good. So maybe at tier one they are viable, but after that I don't see the appeal. Next we have the Lokatha. I think these are probably the best of the aquatic races if for some reason you're playing an underwater campaign. The advantage uh, on saves versus a stack of conditions is pretty sweet, so I give them a rating of average. Next we have Loxodons, and these are interesting because of the trunk. The uh, This opens up certain grapple builds. You can still use two-handed weapons and sword and board and then still grapple with that trunk. So I can see that being effective if the build is, is right. And advantage to perception never hurts. Then we have the Minotaur, and I consider them average. They have some appeal to grapple builds because they have some nice melee buffs. And the push does have some appeal if you're combining it with persistent AoE, but otherwise, eh, I give them a rating of average. Next we have Orcs, and they get a bonus action dash as long as they end up closer to their enemies, and that's pretty good but that's the only thing they have. I have to give them a rating of poor. Next we have the Satyr, and the Satyr is one of the standout races in 5th edition because of the high base speed and magic resistance. They get some other stuff too, but magic resistance is the thing. Wow, to get magic resistance? I mean, I shouldn't have to gush about this too much, right? Everybody knows how great that is. So Satyrs get a rating of superior. Next we have shifters, and they're pretty intriguing. That shifter form is good. It is only once per short rest, but you'll get some mileage out of it. Temporary HP never hurts, and some of them have really good abilities. Plus one on AC is fantastic in bounded accuracy. I always give high marks to plus one AC. 
uh, getting extra move and free disengages is fantastic. And the wild hunt ability to not be attacked at advantage within 30 feet, that's pretty sweet, especially if you synergize that with the Barbarian's Reckless Attack. Oh man, that's, uh, that's really nice. So, shifters, I give most of them average, except long tooths are poor. Next we have the Simic Hybrid, and I'm pretty impressed with these. They've got a pretty nice selection for, um, for each of their two abilities. Uh, a glide, a climb speed can be really nice. Uh, certain builds uh, can take advantage of that climb speed. Uh, dropping people is really nice and grab after you grapple them. And your second enhancement is pretty solid. Again, we have plus one AC. Always very impressed with that. And a bonus action grapple. Man, that is excellent for certain grapple builds. So I give Simic Hybrids a rating of good. I like them. Next, we have the Tabaxi. And this one's pretty popular because some people do like speed builds. And it is fast. That double move at will for one turn is really impressive because it affects the base rate and therefore will stack with your dash and other move bumps like fly or haste. So yeah, 240 foot movement per round is awesome. And you can do that crazy cheese grater thing with spike growth <laughs> if you grapple them and then just start dragging them through. Tabaxi's really excel at that. But I mean, that's one tactic. Speed is really nice, but there are other things that I think are better. I give it a rating of average. Next we have the Tiefling and all of their various bloodlines. The first thing that sticks out is that Tieflings have fire resistance, that's great. And then you scan through the options and you see the winged version has a 30 feet fly speed. Fire resistance and fly speed, that gets you into the superior category. The others are okay. Uh, fire resistance is solid to build on, but none of the other stuff is like really that amazing. Pretty limited uses plus a cantrip, eh. But man, Light, yeah, Winged Tiefling is up there. Rating superior for Winged, average for the others. Next we have the Tortle. I'm including this even though it's not technically official because people seem to love it, it's very popular. And I can see why that high base AC is excellent for casters. Uh, better in lower tiers, uh, you know, Magic Armor is gonna exceed that and you might get left behind. But I can see the appeal, they're okay. Uh, I give them a rating of average. Next we have the Triton. And I'm just not that impressed. I give them a rating of poor. That stat bump distribution is interesting, but the one time a day spells aren't that great. I'm not super impressed, so I give them a rating of poor. Next we have Vidalkin, and I give them a rating of average. I am loving that advantage on intelligence, wisdom, and charisma saves. I mean, I loved it on the Deep Gnome, and I love it here. But to just add water breathing, which if you have a wizard who can ritual cast, you can probably water breathe anyway. So I just give them an average, but it is on the high end of average, like almost good. Because that advantage on saves is really, really nice. Next we have the Warforged. And I am impressed with the Warforged. Uh, give it a good rating, because that plus one AC is really amazing. And then it stacks onto an advantage on saves versus poison and poison resistance. Yeah, I, I like that. I like that a lot. Good rating for Warforged. And then finally, the Yuan T. These guys are insane. The defenses are insane. Magic resistance and immune to poisoned and poison resistant or poison damage. Wow, that is almost overpowered. It rivals the Goblin as the strongest race. And if you're not a lover of hide builds like I am, it probably is the strongest race. The only thing bad about it is that they are a, the evil race with a bad reputation and they look really weird and distinctive so you might have some role playing issues. But from a strict mechanics point of view, Yuan T are probably the best race overall. Although I personally like the Goblin better. So just for the record, I've already mentioned that I like certain racial abilities better than others, but to give you an official ranking, Number one is the bonus action hide disengage. Number two is magic resistance. Number three is flight. And number four is a tie between the starting feat and uh, gnome cunning or the medalcon version. Finally, I wanted to leave you with this chart. I did not make this myself. I found this on Reddit, credit to Honey Badger, but I've looked it over and I think it's quite good. He has put a lot of thought into this. Obviously opinions are going to differ, but 
uh, very minor issues, I think, involved. This is going to be a good chart to help guide you in terms of the classes that you want to take and finding synergies with racial options. So pretty granular. I'm not going to talk about it, but I will put it up and it's going to be included in the document so you guys can use it at your leisure. Whew. So that's it. That's my analysis of all of the races post Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. One of my longer ones, but I felt like it needed to be done. And now I have a document that's going to help me build my characters going forward. And I'm sharing it with you guys. So let me know what you think in the comments. I suspect that there's going to be a few nuances that didn't come to mind for me. So please let me know what you think. And regardless, thank you so much for watching. This has been the Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition Power Gamers Tactics Room. I'm your host, Bill Brown Bafflestone. See you next time.